The battle was brutal, fought in cold temperatures with snow and freezing rain, and lasted more than six weeks and took many lives on both sides. Various commemorations and events surrounding the Battle of the Bulge have been cancelled. And due to the COVID-19 crisis, the veterans are also unable to travel to the Ardennes to attend the commemorations. And we do not want to let this momentum pass by. And that is why we have decided to reflect on this 76th anniversary with this online live stream. Together with co-host historian Reg Jans, we will look back at the events of December 1944. And we start with a presentation about the Battle of the Bulge by Reg Jans. After which we have an interview with World War II veterans, Jim P.B. Martin, Frank Sisson, and the granddaughter of General George Patton, Helen Patton. And we conclude this live stream with a digital visit to the 101st Airborne Museum, the Mess in Bastogne. Rick, it is a privilege that you are present during this live stream to share your stories with uh, people all over the world. And for the last 20 years, Rick Jans has been guiding on the European battlefields from Normandy and Operation Market Garden. And he has now become better known by his distinguished in-depth uh, research on the Battle of the Bulge. And he will now take you in a short presentation about the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, Rick, the floor is all yours. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Joel, for uh, having me on this live stream as a co-host. Um, and let me speak about my passion, uh, the Battle of the Bulge, not to be confused with the Battle of the Bugle. That's a story about a guy who knows nothing about music, okay? Something completely different. Well, I got 30 minutes. Um, it's needless to say, presenting the Battle of the Bulge in 30 minutes is as, is as easy as beating Mike Tyson in a boxing match. You know, blindfolded with one hand glued to your back, jumping up on one leg and reciting uh, Hamlet in Chinese. So, but I will try to do my best to explain um, the plan, the situation um, here uh, after the liberation in September, um, Hitler's plan, the buildup and the outro of the Battle of the Bulge. I'm gonna try to keep it very, very short. And uh, I tried to explain it um, in an understandable, easy to digest way to both our American viewers and our European viewers. Now, when we talk about the Battle of the Bulge, one must know it's still one of the largest ground battles that was fought in the history of the United States Army. A total of 600,000 Americans were committed to this battle, and that is without the guys from logistics. So that's another 200,000. A total of 61 American divisions were deployed here over a massive battlefield because the Battle of the Bulge is so much more than just Bastogne or St. Fit or Elsenborn, uh, because we cover 1,450 square miles of battlefield. So that's 3,450 square kilometers. So this was a massive battle. When we talk about casualties, 76,800 American casualties, killed in action, missed in action, wounded in action, uh, more than 100,000 uh, German casualties. During the Battle of the Bulge, two bayonet charges were performed by American units, both attached to the 84th uh, Infant, um, Airborne Division, the 82nd Airborne Division, sorry. Uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, 20 Americans were awarded with the Medal of Honor. So if you bring all the numbers together, 600 plus Americans fighting this battle, 55,000 British, British fighting here in the battle, 10,000 Belgians, uh, more than 400,000 Germans uh, troops uh, total um, deployed here. So that brings that number over a million people fighting each other here for five and a half weeks. So that was a massive battle. But where did it all begin? How did it all got started? First, we have to go back to uh, the beginning of the liberation, the liberation of Europe. Uh, that means if you look at the map right here, we're going to, it's, it's a very it's a very simple map, but you can see Belgium up up here, uh, you, here you can see France down in Luxembourg. Uh, this is the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. For the people who have never traveled to Europe, there's three Luxembourgs. Okay, Belgium can be split up in ten provinces. One of the southern provinces is called the province of Luxembourg. Then what you see here is the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, which means it's an independent country. 
and its capital is the city of Luxembourg. And I personally think they did that to con confuse any other enemies trying to invade us. Like, okay, let's take Luxembourg, which one, which one? The blue line that you see here is a secret line, fortifications built by the Germans to reinforce their border, uh, almost 600 miles long from all the way up near the border with, with Holland, all the way down to, to the Swiss border near Basel. Now on June 6th, uh, on D-Day, Operation Overlord started. The invasion of Europe, the liberation of Europe. American and British troops landed on the Normandy beaches quick process to France. Well, the first two months were, were not that quickly, but once that Paris was liberated in August 25, the troops moved very, very fast to Belgium and up to the German border. Actually, too fast, because they only scheduled to reach that area after nine to 10 months of battling, but they got there after three months already, which caused a lot of problems with logistics because the logistics were still coming in from Normandy, from the Norman beaches. At La Havre, a bit to the north, the Allies established a makeshift uh, port to bring in more supplies to the American and British troops here to the north in Belgium. The big plan was to establish a new supply line from Antwerp, from Dover to Antwerp, to supply the troops here in Belgium. By September 1944, Antwerp was already liberated, except for the city of the Schelde, uh, which is right up here. One side was still occupied by German forces, as well as Netherlands was still occupied by the Germans. So supplies from England could not be brought in through Antwerp until October 1944. Now, on to Berlin, that was the next step uh, after the liberation. So you liberate Europe, then you move and you try to get to Berlin. The reason for that, people thought when Berlin falls, Germany will capitulate. At least that's what the Allies thought, but not just the Allies. Because also, I'm sorry, i got to go back. There you go. These guys uh, wanted to beat each other in their way to Berlin. On your right, you have General Zhukov. At that moment, the Soviet, the Red Army of the Soviet Union was knocking on Nazi Germany's doors, Germany's doors on the east, trying to make it to Berlin first. On the left, General Omar Bradley, commanding the Allied ground, ground forces here uh, after Operation Overlord, trying to make his way to Berlin. Now, Great commander Omar Bradley worked closely with General Patton. Once Patton even called him a tent maker because he thought he never moved fast enough. But this time they moved too fast to get to the Siegfried line to the German border. They went so fast up there that to the northern part in the military camp of Elsenborn, American engineers uh, occupied three big watchtowers on top of the hill to oversee the Ruhr Valley and the German border. The whole place was, was, was covered with trees with large uh, spruces blocking the view. So the engineers cut like a clearance through the woods so they could still use these watchtowers. Now to make uh, a statement, some of the engineers cut the woods in front of one of the watchtowers out in the shape of an arrow that was pointing to Berlin. Now, when you look carefully on Google Earth, you can still see the leg of the arrow pointing to Berlin. Now, a big problem, of course, also for the Allies was that the line that you see here, the Siegfried line. Uh, fortifications, one, two, three lines after each other, very often with anti-aircraft guns, bunkers, fortresses, you know, connected to each other, almost impossible to break through. So another solution was, if we cannot break through, we can try to go around that secret line to the north and reach the Ruhr area just north of Cologne. Because that's the industrial heart of Nazi Germany. If we can neutralize that and take the dams on the Ruhr River so the Germans would not flood the entire Ruhr Valley, we can make it easily to Berlin beating the Russians to it. 
Well, that idea came originally from the British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, and it was codenamed Operation Comet. Later, the plan got modified and changed into Operation Market Garden, the largest ground air operation in the history of World War II. Of course, this was not a big success, but that's another story, that's another battle, that's another month. Uh, but Montgomery um, always was blamed for the failure of this operation. That's a long discussion. I don't want to go into that one right now. But Montgomery, during the time after Operation Market Garden, spent about two months, uh, or well, three months, in his headquarters in the little town of Houthala, Belgium. Uh, he was not alone there because he was there all the time with his dogs. And one of his dogs was a Cocker Spaniel that he named Rommel. Now, unfortunately, poor little Rommel got run over by a British lorry on December 18, right at the start of the Battle of the Bulge, you know, two days after. And the legend says that poor Rommel was buried on the grounds of the manor. Now, talking to the family, they repeatedly told me that they had never found any bones or a dog tag that said Rommel. So it's still a legend, but the poor Copper Spaniel has now his own memorial right in front of the map. How about that, huh? Now, back to the battle. Trying to go around the Siegfried Line at the same time, because the Ruhr Valley and the dams on the Ruhr were so important to the Allies, they launched an offensive frontally onto the Siegfried Line, just east of Aachen, in an area called Hirchenwald, Hirchen Forest, right here. The, for three months, a fierce battle was fought on different objectives on the Siegfried Line at Hirchenwald, trying to make progress and break through the lines there, unfortunately, without success. If you go further south to the coast front, you see the Netherlands to the north, which was still occupied by the Germans, the Belgian border with Germany, and Luxembourg to the south. Now, you can see a lot of Allied troops, mostly America's first army, around Aachen, still for Operation Market Garden and Birchenwald. Well, here to the south, at the Belgian German border, five divisions were deployed. You know, it was a combination of really experienced units, like the first one here, the second, the Indian Head Division, which is the second infantry, all, already was in combat in Europe in World War uh, One. Then you had the 99th Infantry Division. This was the first time in combat. They were nicknamed the uh, the Battle Babies. To the south, 106th in Infantry Division, not really big experience. Out of the 28th Infantry Division, or the Bloody Buckets Division, and to the very south of all were backed up by just one armored division, the 9th Armored Division, over a front of 88 miles. You may think that that's not enough, but at, actually at, at that moment it was because nobody believed anything to happen in that area. These lines were very thin. Now the unexperienced held the experienced. Um, normally one division is supposed to cover about six to seven mile front line to give you an idea that here, the 28th Infantry Division, they covered 26 miles. You know? They had been put on that line, rotated back on that line after they had been fighting at the Hurtian Forest, losing nearly 50% of their men. So for rest and recuperation, they were put on the line, stretched out over 26 miles. So what did they do? They would dig in, uh, set up command posts on the high grounds, uh, as for the 28th Division, mostly on the N7 National Way between White Swanbach, St. Feet, and, and Dikir, uh, which they called the Skyline Drive. They would settle up, bivouac on the high grounds, and these valleys would be controlled by constantly sending patrols through it. That's how they controlled that area. But nobody expected anything to happen down there. You know, it was just, you know, get out there, you're overseas, you know, you do some patrolling, do some reporting, nothing will happen. Uh, write letters home, it's good, it looks good on your resume, okay? Now, I just mentioned the 28th Infantry Division, this was their shoulder patch. Uh, it's uh, actually a keystone because that division originated out of Pennsylvania, which is called the Keystone State. Now, when the Germans noticed it, that it was colored red, 
after several battles, also at Schumann's Egg in Luxembourg, they said that it looked like a bucket full of blood. So the division at that time adopted the name and called themselves the Bloody Bucket Division. At that time, the commander of the division was General Norman Cota, who distinguished himself on D-Day at Omaha Beach, like by forcing a breakthrough there on D-Day. Another one, a regimental commander of the 109th Regiment, was James the E. Rudder, who led the Rangers up to Point Hawk uh, on D-Day. So they were both now deployed inside the 28th Infantry Division. Now, the keystone for Americans, it may look really familiar, but to us Americans, now, now we're like, what, where, where have I seen this before? Where have I seen this before? Well, probably where you have seen this before is right here. Okay, Heinz tomato ketchup and the label because Heinz headquarters is in Pennsylvania. There you go. The red has nothing to do with the ketchup, of course. Now, Operation Wacht am Rhein was the code name for Adolf Hitler to, for one last time, launch a counteroffensive here in Europe to turn the situation back into his favor. After losing so many troops in Normandy and in the East Front, it was now time to do something about it. The code name for his plan, Operation Wacht am Rhein, wait at the Rhine River. Of course, there's no Rhine River in Belgium. Now, that's why it's called a code to mislead the enemy, right? So, Gerd von Rundstedt is the guy to the right, and Walter Model is the guy to the left. These were the guys who um, had to roll out the plan for Adolf Hitler. Hitler had discussed it with um, his trustees, uh, and mostly with, with Mr. Jodl, uh, uh, about the idea he had to launch a massive attack, you know, to build up his forces, draft everybody back in the army, pull heavy tank units back from the East Front and do one big gamble. When he explained the plan to Rundstedt and Model, both of them actually nodded their head and said there were too many risks, too many what ifs, what ifs. So both of them came up with an alternative plan, starting the attack, like a smaller attack or from different locations or combining attacks and stuff. But Hitler actually, he wiped it off the table and he says, my idea, that's the one that will be carried out. The only thing he changed was the code name. He changed the Wacht am Rhein into Herb's neighbor, Autumn Spring, which was the code name of Model's plan. Now, what was the plan? You see here the situation, same map as we saw before. The plan was to launch a massive attack in this region of Belgium. Why here? Because he knew this was a weak spot in the defense line because the troops were all stretched out because nobody expected anything to happen, especially not with heavy tanks in this area because there's a lot of hills, mountains, dirt roads, creeks, valleys, rivers, not perfect for tanks at all. So the plan was attack in that area. They knew that area, by the way, because they've been attacking through there in 1914. They did it in 1940 uh, and now they were going to do it again. The bigger the surprise, the better, because the success of this operation all depended on the two S's. Not the SS, but speed and surprise. Taken by surprise using three armies, total of 29 divisions. Run over to the American troops, cross the Meuse River, River at three different locations. The reasons for that is once you cross the Meuse River coming from the south, the geography changes and it all turns turns flat. You know, the south is kind of like hills and mountains, but once you cross the Meuse River, no obstacle straight away to Antwerp. And the objective was of Antwerp. Very important because if this would work, he would cut a wedge to the Allied lines and isolate the entire army here to the north. General Courtney Hodges' first army that was attacking the Martin Garden is still attacking at the Hurtin Forest. He would actually hostage 200,000 men. By taking the port of Antwerp, he would also cut off the supplies coming in from England, the northern supply line that was established since October. And he would actually cut off the supply line. Now, there's three uh, things an army cannot survive without. It's uh, logistics, supplies, and communications. If you take one or more as one, 
out, you're going to win the battle one way or another. So the plan was cut off his supplies, isolate him. And this would put him in a real good position to start negotiating to force both the Americans and the British into negotiations. Unconditional negotiations for an unconditional surrender. And maybe if he was smart enough to help him to help the Germans and turn against the Russians, but to turn the situation completely around using these hostages. Now, this is the plan, of course, in a nutshell, because there's much more to it, as more people will post after this presentation. But I'm trying to keep it as small as, as possible. Now, the Battle of the Bulge, well, as you can see here, this is the line from the 99th Division, that orange line, to denounce where they almost reached the most, it's shaped as a bulge. So that's why they call it, still refer to it, the Battle of the Bulge. While the Belgians call it the Battle of the Ardennes and the Germans call it the von Rundstedt Offensive. December 16, 1944. Today, exactly 76 years ago. At 5.30 in the morning, Hitler moved 2,000 pieces of artillery to the front line on the German side. And they simultaneously opened up on the American lines. The barrages increased, intensified. The guys here at the border had no clue what was going on because every day they received what they called incoming mail. You know, Germans from their side still dropping shells on the Americans, throwing punches, letting them know, like, hey, we're still here. But after about an hour, they knew, they quickly knew this was more than the daily shellings. This was part of something really, really big. Now, 40. Germans, what was very important to reach their objective and reach the Meuse in two days, reach Antwerp in five days, was, of course, the road network. Because back then, not, mostly the national roads were paved, but not on the pave like we are paved now, but they were back then like reinforced roads, uh, gravel roads. The other roads were kind of gravel roads. But in between the villages and the towns, most of these roads were dirt roads. So these steady roads needed to be used by German forces to move their heavy armored troops uh, to the objectives. But even more important, not just the roads, but also these road hubs, you know, where these roads come together. So for logistics and supplies, it's very, very important. And one of the towns up to the north on their shortest route to Antwerp was St. Fit, where six of these roads came together in a hub. So one of the major objectives on the first days was the town of St. Fit. Another one was here to the south, Bastel, where seven roads came together in a road hub. Uh, of course, extra troops were sent to these towns to uh, secure the crossroads there. Now, as for St. Fit, met for several days, uh, the 106th Infantry guys held that town. Um, so the Germans were only able uh, to, to seize the town about days after they had scheduled to do so. Uh, for Bastogne, I'm going to keep this really short, the Germans were not able to take these crossroads uh, to their own frustration because they kept sending reinforcements, reinforcements to Bastogne. But, you know, the 101st Division, 10th Armored Division, Elements of the 28th Infantry Division, 9th Armored Division, who all got stuck in Bastogne, steadily held the line at all costs, um, which of course made them famous. Many movies were made about them. Um, and they actually held the Germans off on their way to the Meuse River at that time. Now, what was the American reaction to it? Uh, the, the American reaction to it was, look, uh, Eisenhower went up north talking in the little town of Hasselt, in a little train wagon, he spoke with Courtney Hodges and ordered him to direct his troops, you know, to the south. At the same time, he spoke, well, not the same time, around the same period, he spoke with uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, and he says, like, we need someone to come in from the flank, you know, from the west, you know, uh, linking up with the 2nd Armored Division, uh, could you do that? And you know, Montgomery said, "Hey, listen, I still got uh, elements of my 30th Corps of Barracks available. I got you know the airborne guys are still ready. We had some a lot of losses in Holland, but, but we can still do it. I they, 
I still got my Canadian parachute battalion. The Scots are still waiting to play their bagpipes on the battlefield. Uh, so yeah, we'll do it. Well, 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 well. Let's. Well, well, but only when I am in charge of the operation. So uh, Eisenhower said, "Like, no, okay, we need to talk here." So he made him apologize for his suggestion. So the British coming in. The Brits coming in now from the west, and at the same time, General George Patton's Third Army that was fighting in the north of France, fighting east towards uh, the Saar area, towards the Siegfried Line. Uh, uh, he was on a meeting on the, on the 21st at the military barracks uh, in Metz and um, with, with Roosevelt and the guys. And uh, he said, listen, if you want, I can break off my attack, uh, make a 90 degree turn to the north and cover that 130 mile distance in three days with, with my troops, with my army. Uh, and Eisenhower said, well, you don't really think you can pull it off? And Patton said, well, listen, I, I only have to pick up the phone and say the code word, which would be pen, a dime. And my officers know exactly which scenario, which plan to carry out. So Patton's army started to move further to the north. And you can see him now come in from every direction, from the north, from the west, from the south. You know, blocking off uh, the German troops creating like a bowl-shaped front line, preventing them to get to the Meuse Rip. Rally point for these armies to meet would be the town of Hoofelis, about 12 kilometers north of Bastogne. Now, Hoofelis got completely bombed to pieces by the, mostly by the Americans and, and German, uh, American airplanes, German uh, artillery. Uh, but Hoofelis was the rally point. Once they would have gotten there, they would have closed and closed the bulge right here, closed this bulge, and then it was time to push them back to the German border. That was the American reaction. Now, if you look at it, you can think, well, that's the most logical uh, solution. You know, it's the most logical plan that you could carry out. Uh, true. But you have to bear in mind that this was not a planned operation. It was not like Normandy, uh, where they've been training, been planning you know, for years, you know, with the aerial photos, the, the diversion, the, the ghost armies, all the espionage, counter espionage, stuff like this. Market Garden, okay, you just had a handful of days to prepare. But this was a German surprise attack. Nobody ever expected anything to happen in this, in this area. Maybe it was because of a lack of intelligence or maybe being too much focused on getting to Berlin, not believing anything else could happen. Um, but all of a sudden, these Germans attack with 250,000 men on December 16, crossing the border, then systematically sending reinforcements across the border into Belgium. The total number estimated lies around 400,000 Germans in this battle. And all of a sudden, you know, as an army, you don't know the area, you don't have decent maps, and you have to react. You can look at maps, you can look at bridges, um, uh, but still it's an amazing thing. How about the logistics to mobilize all these troops on these difficult roads or dense roads to the south? It's quite an achievement to have done it, but I must, it must be said, these first eight days all along uh, the front line, it was a complete, complete chaos. Of course, it was very easy like, to, to use the Germans' uh, idea against them because the Germans wanted to go fast, 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 fast so that the Allies did not have time to respond or react. So if you can slow them down, you can. And thanks to the geography, that was the best possible solution the Allies could do because instead of moving on a broad front like tank units do, here in the Ardennes, you, they were always stuck on these lines, on these roads. So you don't need a massive army you know, to, to, to stop a tank column. You just need a handful of men with an anti-tank gun or some mines to block or disable the first vehicles or the lead vehicles of a column. You block the entire column for maybe 20, 30 minutes, which is just enough time for the engineers down at the bridge to blow up the bridge, causing the enemy a lot of trouble. So they're losing time, they're losing fuel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in a nutshell, that is exactly what happened during the Battle of the Bulge. Of course, the Germans wanted to use the surprise effect, waited for the weather reports to come in, so the air 
um, force could not fly, which worked very, very well. But the Americans were able to hold them off, to slow them down long enough till the fog lifted all over the Ardennes, and there was the Air Force taking out these German tank columns. So if you ever, again, see anyone who can explain this in less than 30 minutes, hire him. You're going to be hired, sir, Rick. Okay, <laughs> one more thing. Well, well, thank you very much. What I wanted to say, one more thing. I'm going to go to the next one. Uh, our next guests, uh, I hope they're ready. Uh, these are really two of my personal heroes. Seriously. So I'm so proud. I'm so happy to be able to talk to them uh, today. So, yes, uh, uh, Rick, I, I'm looking forward to the interviews. Uh, um, thank you, Rick, for this amazing presentation. We are now going to look at an impressive video footage of the Battle of the Bills. We will be right back with you with the first interview with 101st Airborne Division veteran Jim P.B. Martin. Perfect. See you, uh, after a couple of minutes. Our hunk of the line was the Yarden. Pretty quiet. A lot of outfits had gone up north. I started a million of training grounds about the where and when of our offensive. Then one day I'm standing guard and these shells start. I thought for a minute this was it. Till I realized these shells weren't outgoings, brother. They were incomings. Next thing I knew, German tanks. It was an offensive, all right. But it was going the wrong way. The offensive we were mounting to the north was suddenly forestalled and set aside, as through the rugged, thinly held Arden, von Rundstedt struck. He cut a fiery path through the American lines and sent his tanks desperately driving toward the river Meurs. A night of fog and pale December frost saw the beginning, none foresaw the end. He aimed for Antwerp's harbor through Liège, and all our plans held fire while we bent our strength to curb the Germans in the bulge. One night I was a replacement in England playing shove haypenny in a pub. The next day they shoved me in an aeroplane and that night I was fighting Germans and being kicked around. I don't know about the other outfits, but mine was being cut to ribbons. They were dropping all around me. The thing that still sticks in my head is the medics. The only weapon they had was a needle, but they were around right where it was the hottest. You'd hear that yell, medic, medic, and they'd always be there. Our whole division got a presidential citation for what happened up at Bastogne. Even me, just a cook. I'll never forget that old lieutenant running into the field kitchen and hollering at me if and I had any idea how to operate a bazooka. I said no, and he said, well, you're going to learn now, son. I did, and I'll be doggone if in the first shot out the barrel I didn't get me a Jerry Tank. Got interviewed later by Stars and Stripes. They said it was a crackerjack story. I tell it at the drop of a hat. We've been up north where things were a bit static, so we were quite glad to be moved down to the top side of this bulge. Coming down through Belgium, we noticed how scared some of the civilians looked. Natural, I suppose. We were held in reserve for a week, and then they sent us into action. On account of the fog, we couldn't get any air coordination. You sure miss it bad when you've gotten used to it all the way since D-Day. And then on December 24th, like a Christmas present, that sun come up and after a while we was giving him the old one-two again. We stopped them dead, finally. It cost us plenty of men, but we stopped them. And we started moving ahead again. The rest of us.
live stream again. Amazing uh, footage about the Battle of the, uh, the Bulls. Um, welcome to this uh, live stream, Jim. Hello. <laughs> um, Hello. It's a privilege that you are present during the live stream to share uh, the stories with uh, people from all over the world. Rek, I think it's a privilege. Absolutely. It's always uh, a tremendous privilege to be able to talk to a World War II veteran, um, and especially one who's been to most of the campaigns like Normandy, Market Garden, Battle of the Bulge, etc., such as, such as Jim. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Uh, Jim, uh, today is it 76 years ago that the Battle of the Bulge started. What can you still remember about this event in 1944? Jim, what are your memories of this day in 1944? They came in in the early hours. What happened? Well, we were, we were supposed to get ready to go to the States and get a furlough and go to Guam to get ready to jump in Japan. And all of a sudden, about four in the morning, a sergeant came in and turned the lights on and said, get up, there's been a breakthrough and we're going. And I swore they must know us some more of this army stuff. And he, he said, no, it isn't. And so all day, people running around. And of course, we turned in all our weapons, too. And um, we didn't have K rations. We didn't have an ammunition or anything. Yeah. So, and Jim, stuff, Jim, if, if I may interrupt you a little bit, um, you know, the 101st, you just returned from Operation Market Garden to a military camp in North France in Mourmelon, Mourmelon. And that's where you got the news that you had to move out again. Can you still remember, were you, were you at the camp or were you out in Paris or anywhere else partying when you got the news that you, you had to head back to, to, to base camp and that you guys were going into combat again? Yeah. Did you hear that, Jim? Okay, Reg wants to know, where were you at when you got the news that you had to, were you out in Paris or where, where were you at when you got the news that you were gonna have to move out again? I was in a barracks. All of us were in a barracks at that time, I remember. And we were all upset because we didn't think we we're gonna go any place. Yeah. And, you know, today's a good day to do this because I look out my window and we're having a snow just like we had up there. And then of course we got in trucks that evening, they came in with trucks and we got these big trucks, open side trucks, no roof on them. And so crowded while we waited in the morning is when we started. But anyway, we're going in night with the lights on and we went about a hundred miles and they dumped us out in the field and we didn't know where we were and nobody had maps or anything, no officer did either. And uh, so they were asking civilians around there that uh, when you went on vacation, you, did you get maps or pictures or whatever? And that's the only thing they had. And so then during the next day, they said there's a town here that you're supposed to protect. And they had a sign there and as we went in, I don't know why I said it. I said, take a look at that sign. I think we're gonna make history here. Well, I forgot about it later. Some of the guys said, remember what you said? And I said, yeah. They said, well, we sure are doing it, aren't we? And I said, yes. And so they put us in a circle around this town and they said, you got to hold this town because Hitler wants this thing to succeed. Yeah. And then when McAuliffe went down to see uh, the general, what he wanted to do and told him how we were. And the, the general talked about having a, a just a straight defense in the front. And McCullough came back and said, well, we're going to have to do that. And, and one, of the, one of the guys, Kennard, said, no, I said, I don't think so. And he said, what do you mean? He said, if we have a straight line defense, they're going to flank us the first day and it's going to be over. And so they 
had a consensus then, no, we'll stay in a circle. And that's what we did. And then that saved us. And of course, they had to have the roads to get through and do this, what they wanted to do, because that hilly country, the swamps, there's the high ground, low ground, uh, creeks and everything. And without the roads, they couldn't do what they're going to do. The worst part is nobody in the high command expected this to happen because they had tried that once before, uh, not too long ago, and it failed. And then when they got this, they, they just figured this was going to peter out. And of course, it didn't. And some guys, some units were in Paris. And so they, they picked everybody up and brought them back. And then there's some officer from another outfit heard we didn't have ammunition. He got a truck load of ammunition parked as we went by. We put the picked up what ammunition we could. And then we're, always we went on a mission, we're supposed to have nine K rations. That's for three days. Well, I had one. Some guys had two. Some guys had none. So as a result of that on Christmas day, I had lemon powder and snow with cordite mixed for my Christmas dinner. <laughs> so, uh, so Jim, so uh, you guys moved out on the double. You had no idea where you were going because Hitler broke through somewhere in Belgium. So you arrive, <laughs> you assemble in the field, you walk towards Bestone, you dig in like in a circle around the town, right? Barely no ammunition, no food. Um, I assume you didn't have any any winter clothing because I remember a guy from. Uh, from your division telling me once, he said, when I got to Bestone, uh, the only weapons I had, I had my M1 Garand, I had <clears> 21 <throat> rounds of ammo and two hand grenades. But I assume that you didn't have the, these winter clothing either. But by what time, when did you realize like that, that this was much more than, than, let's say, a little skirmish? This would be like, like, like a massive fight for Bestone. Jim, a couple questions Greg wants to know. Uh, describe what you were wearing and what equipment that you had, mainly what you were wearing uh, when you got to your position opposite Racon. And then at what point did it dawn on the fellows in your outfit that this is a major, major attack by the Germans, not just some, uh, you know, spoiling attack or something? Talk about your clothes first. Mm -hmm. What did you have? All we had on was our jump jackets and jump pants, nothing else, no overcoats or anything. <clears throat> and we knew this was serious immediately because there were guys coming down from the north and they were traumatized. And they said, where are you guys going? They said, we're going up to fight. And they said, oh no, I said, you won't go up there killing everybody. And then they, they were coming with some no weapons. They'd thrown their weapons away. Some had weapons and we took them away from them. And then there was a, and all, a couple of officers came down with a Jeep and stopped them. And one of our officers said, uh, get out of the Jeep. We want the Jeep. And he said, oh no, it belongs to our unit. And he pointed his machine gun at him and said, uh, I said, get out of that damn Jeep. That's ours. And that's, that's the way things went. And of course, that was the first 106th. They'd never been in combat at all. And the 28th was completely out of anything. They just put out there to just to get used to living out there. And the same with the 106th. Now, I have always said that should not have happened. And I talked to the intelligence people. Now, the people were reporting back to them that they heard a lot of planes coming too. And they, they said, don't pay attention to that at all. And of course the weather was socked in and they, our planes couldn't fly. So for 10 days, they couldn't refly us. So all we had was what we went in with. And that's, that's the way it was, you lived that way. And it was, it, it was drizzling rain all the time we were going. And then uh, a couple of days later, it's, the snow started and the temperature dropped. 
and there was a wind always 15 to 25 miles an hour wind and swept the roads clean in some places and then other places when it got kept snowing it was hip deep and that's the way we lived and uh, I'll tell you this nobody complained about it not a damn thing the only thing they ever said was damn it's cold and complained about the cold said we ever get out of here I'm going to get the biggest stake in town but nobody really complained. It's just the way it was. We accepted whatever happened. And so, we adapted. Jim, so, yeah. so Jim, did you, uh, I, I understand that you suffered a case of frostbite on your fingers uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, but what did you do? Did you, did you do anything particular to stay warm in your foxhole side of Reconia? Okay. Jim, when you were uh, opposite uh, Reconia in your, in your slit trench, um, Talk about the effect on your hands and your feet and what measures did the guys take or did you take to try to stay warm as best you could? What did you do to cope? There's nothing really you can do. Now, some guys dug a deep foxhole, but after about three or four days, you couldn't dig because the ground froze. I made a slit trench because I knew that at times we may have to move. And well, we didn't. So that's what I had the whole time. Yes, it wasn't just frostbite. It was actually my hands froze and I still suffer from that. And it changed color as soon as it gets 40 degrees or below. And my feet were frozen. And of course you couldn't do anything for it because there was no circulation. So you couldn't, the only thing they did when they took you out, put you in a hospital is put you in a bed and let your feet out and a nurse would walk by and that wind from her would hit your feet and it felt like fire. Now I stayed there until the 15th. And then I said to the Lieutenant, I just can't stand this anymore. And he said, just go on up there. And they'll take you out. The guys were leaving that for that reason. Well, we, they stayed a few more days and by no, they're going to stay a little longer. I would have stayed, but, I'll tell you what, I've been three weeks in the hospital, the most miserable time I ever spent in the Army. Uh, and the worst part, any time, is about three to four in the morning, just before dawn, everything seems worse. And if you have a guy die, that's what happens. Another thing they said, a lot of the guys, uh, uh, get wounded when we're out chasing those people and then come back and we couldn't take our wounded. And they said that uh, they go out three days later and get them and, and uh, they died of their wounds. They didn't die of their wounds, they froze to death. Now there were some couple of guys who did something and you'll find this rather macabre, but a couple of guys dug a pretty deep hole big enough to get down in and big enough for two guys. And they took frozen bodies and put across the top of it in case shell fire came in, it wouldn't come down on top of them. But you know, nobody thought anything about that. I mean, that's the body's a body, period. Nowadays, they put you in jail for doing that. Yeah, but the time, times are also different uh, of course, because you know, at that stage of the battle, you guys already had been through Normandy. You guys already had been like 70 days market garden. So this was not your first time in combat. You get battle hardened at, at, at one point. Not everybody, of course. Um, but uh, as I remember well, at one point, you the town of Bastogne got completely surrounded. And your commanding officer, the overall commander of the encircled troops in Bastogne, General McAuliffe, gets an ultimatum from the Germans demanding your surrender. Can you pick it up from there, Jim? Okay, tell, let's tell the story of McCulloch's response to the German well, commander's yes. demand to surrender. Uh, Taylor was at Washington talking about other operations and McCulloch was in charge. And uh, when they came in and demanded, he's, he thought that they were going to surrender to us. They came in through 322nd, 27th Glider Harbor, Colonel Harper's 
and Harper put a band, a blindfold, and brought them in there. And uh, Kennard said, no, they're not surrendering to us. They want us to surrender. And McCall said, oh, nuts. What am I going to say to this guy? And Kennard said, that last thing you said was pretty good. He said, what do you mean? He said, you said nuts. And so they wrote nuts on a piece of paper and gave it to Colonel Harper and told him to take them back out. And he went back out there through his outpost and took the blindfold off and gave this German officer. And the guy looked at it, Neutz, Neutz, what does that mean? He said, that means nuts. And he said, well, a lot of people are gonna get killed. That doesn't go with the humanity that you people have. And Harper said to him, we're going to kill every goddamn German tries to come into this town. And he said, we'll give you two hours to make up your mind. If you don't, then we're going to destroy you with artillery. Well, Sepp Dietrich wanted to get to Antwerp. Now, he was the one who was supposed to, he had the artillery and was going to get rid of us. But he wanted to get to Antwerp and get that ammunition dump. And he ignored that order. And then when he got toward the Antwerp, Montgomery hadn't cleared it, so he didn't get that either. So he, he, he didn't get anything. And Sepp had the, uh, most of his people thought he was a hot dog. They didn't like him anyway. But anyway, we stayed there and it was miserable. And I mean, miserable. And you can imagine what it's like when you get up and stamp around a little bit. Then how do you decide when it's safe enough to take off your get your penis out and pee. And I'll tell you what, they shriveled up so much, if I could have tied a knot, I'd have put a string on and pull it out. No matter how careful you are, you put it back in, it dribbles down your leg. And for a little bit, that feels warm and then it feels terrible. And then you don't know when to take a crap. We had one of our guys went out in the bushes to take a crap and the German patrol came through and they shot him in the rear end and then laughed and left. He came running out, the blood running out. As soon as the medics patched him up and saw the flesh room, then that boy laughed. Of course, he went out, he got the million dollar wound. Jim, talk about how you got water. That's an interesting story. Oh, well, that's another thing. How'd you get water? We we're cautioned about eating snow because that you go into hypothermia that way. So they scouted around and about a mile from us, they found a small lake. And so we'd take two of our guys and they'd steal a jerry can off of a truck or a tank that had fuel in it, either diesel or gasoline, and take it over there and, and take your rifle and break the ice. The ice was about three or four inches thick and they'd break the ice. And the Germans were using it too, but luckily we didn't have a problem about it. Well, then you get it back and you fill a canteen and you got to drink it right away. Because if you don't, it'll freeze. And of course it tastes like gasoline and diesel too. So that's not very good either. So that, that's the way things are. And you just accept it. That's the way it is. And, and it's, it's amazing how people's spirits were so good and adapted to the conditions we were in. It just is absolutely, I still am amazed at it, but that's the way it is, and especially in our unit. But that should never ever have happened, and I'll tell you why. When the guys up along the river, in those units across the river, 106, they were reporting that they were hearing movements of tanks and trucks, a lot of them. And the intelligence people said, oh, you're jumpy and they've been in combat. They're playing records. And that's true. They did at times. But you know what? I talked to the woman who's in charge for the 101st, and she put that out, that magazine they put out every month for everybody in the Army. And I told her that shouldn't have happened. And I said, every officer there, the 106 should have been court-martialed and every one of those intelligence officers that told them that should have been too. 
And she got really upset. What are you talking about? I said, well, let me, let me tell you something. The 101st and the 82nd were never surprised. And you know why? And she said, why? I said, because we made night patrols every single night and we hated them. And if they'd had sent one guy across there, this wouldn't have happened. And the officers that captured four general officers, Germans, and they put them in the same room, which is against the law, but they wanted to see, and they put a microphone and listen to them. And they couldn't understand how we got surprised with all the stuff was stacked up, artillery, tanks, and trucks waiting. Yeah. And they just, said, she said, well, they couldn't fly airplanes. Yeah. Yeah. She said they knew the coordinates. And if they'd have sent a damn scout over there and given the coordinates, they could have carpet blanketed. And those four generals couldn't understand why in the hell they got surprised that way. Yeah. Well, I've talked to them several times since, and it's the same story. Yeah. Reg wants to ask a question. Go ahead, yeah, Reg. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask us. Because, well, well, first of all, uh, Jim, well, thank you so much, you know, for what, not for being with us here now, but for what you and your guys and, and you Americans did uh, uh, 76 years ago, because we still are influenced. You know, our lives wouldn't have been the same, wouldn't have been like, like they are today. So, but look, as a veteran who was actually at that fierce battle in the dead of winter, what would be your message for the people, for the, the children for uh, to, today? No. What, as a, as a veteran who participated in all the operations you did, and specifically the Battle of the Bulge, the defense of Bastogne, what message do you have for young kids these days? If you can What's sum it up in like one or two or three lines, what would be your main yeah, just, message? Yeah, just a very brief message. What would you like them most to know? We live in the freest country in the world because we take care of ourselves with our military. Now, that's another thing. You should always have a military capable of, of at least having two things going on at once, and we don't have that now. Yeah. But I'm amazed, and these young people that are signing up, and I've told group of them that they asked me to come and talk to how I feel about what's going on in the military. I said, let me tell you something. Don't listen to anybody that's pessimistic. You go in there and you do your job, be proud of what you're doing. And I'm going to tell you something else. It's going to be hard and sometimes you're going to hate the army. But when you get up to my age, you're going to look back and think that's the best part of your life. You didn't realize it. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much, Jim, for being with us here tonight. Yeah. Joel, anything else you want yeah, to? Uh... Yeah, I wish you a really Merry Christmas, uh, uh, oh, yeah, uh, Jim, yeah. and, uh, and a good and healthy 2021. And hopefully we can meet you again next year somewhere at commemorations and events. Hopefully when the, the, the COVID crisis is over and we can travel again, uh, Jim. Yeah. So both Joel and uh, Reg wish you a very Merry Christmas and they hope to see you sometime soon. Merry Christmas to you, and I hope we can see somebody pretty quick. Yes, it's hopefully. Be Merry long Christmas long to you, Jim. Easy. No, no. Jim, take care. Merry Thank Christmas, you. Doug. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Thank you very much. Greg. Good seeing you. Likewise. Good seeing you guys. Hey, we are now going to look at the second video about the Battle of the Builds, and we will be right back with you with another World War II veteran, Frank Sisson. Uh, we will be right back. A couple of minutes. Look at this amazing video. December 16th, the triumphant cheers died down in Europe. In the Christmas season of 1944, nobody was predicting that the war would end by Saturday night or a week from Wednesday. And today, with the good news from all fronts singing on all radios, let us remember the dying days of 1944. The infantry remembers those days. Men who had not retreated since their arrival in Europe plodded back along the mean roads of winter Belgium. 
Convoys of trucks streamed to the rear with supplies that had been painstakingly accumulated at forward dumps. Supplies that could not be moved were put to the torch. Millions of man-hours of work to be put in all over again. To stop counterattacks, huge new reserves of supplies are called for. But that is how a war is. Wasteful, unpredictable, uncertain, dangerous demanding constant wariness, constant preparation for the worst, a constant and unflagging spirit in the face of all alarms and disasters. Gallant American units, surrounded and cut off, fought in a sea of enemy armor. Anti-aircraft guns were fired point blank as anti-tank guns until they were overrun. Quartermaster and line of communications troops picked up their rifles and fought tenaciously against Nazi columns. The weather cleared and the Air Force took to the skies to bomb and strafe and fight the rejuvenated Luftwaffe to the ground. the spearhead stopped, the Nazi columns contained and thrown back by men who had flung themselves into the breach. In the wild gamble of war, a momentary equilibrium had been gained. The cost had been great, and there were no guarantees being issued on engraved paper on the Western Front that the time of counterattacks was over. Nor, despite the great victories in the Pacific, were there guarantees being issued that there would be no counterattacks against the many islands we'd won back from the Japs? In the general uncertainty of war, one fact remains certain. The enemy is always dangerous. The enemy always wants to kill Americans. The enemy does not slack off. Is the news good from Russia? Remember the lesson of December. As another Japanese admiral died, remember the Arden Forest. Does it look as though finally we can take it easy? Remember the 78,000 Americans lost in the Christmas holidays. The men in the line pay for counterattacks in dead, wounded, and missing. How do you intend to pay? What were you doing the week the German army came back to Belgium? What are you doing this week? What will you be doing next week? On December 16th... What are you saying to your friend? Read, read. This only is the last part? No, no, no. Uh, read up to that line. Thank you for uh, sharing. Uh, thank you, everybody. It was an amazing uh, video. Uh, welcome back to this uh, live stream. It's a privilege, uh, uh, Frank Sisson, that you are here uh, present during these live streams to uh, to share the fo uh, stories with uh, with our followers all over the world. Uh, Rick, I think it's uh, another amazing that we have a veteran live in our uh, our show tonight. I think. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's 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 just seeing these guys joining us. It's 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 amazing. Uh, especially, hi Frank, how are you doing? Oh, yeah. doing great. You look, you look fantastic. Well, uh, thank you, thank you. With, with the uniform, all dressed up. All dressed up, you know. <laughs> you know, you know, Joel, uh, you know, Frank. Um, I, I remember you telling me uh, that uh, now it's uh, oh, about eighty years ago when you were like 15, 16 year old, You uh, were already working as a shipbuilder in California, right? Uh, yes, as an eighteen-year-old kid. Oh, it's an 18 year old. Yeah, I went in when I was 15 and I left when I was 18. Yeah, so so you left when you were 18 and you joined the army. So being uh -huh. being a shipbuilder, 
Why did you not choose for, for the Navy? Or why did you choose for the Army? I told them I could walk further than I could swim. So I didn't <laughs> want to be in that Navy. <laughs> well, good, good, good point you got there. So, so ultimately, it's basic training, and then you, uh, you ended up in the 667th Field Artillery yes. Battalion. So I assume that these guys weren't fighting the, firing the small guns, right? No, uh, big. 155 and uh, 105. Okay, 105, big, 155 big, uh, long tom yeah. or howitzer? Yeah, we, we can shoot 20 miles. 20 miles? Yeah, we can shoot 20 miles away. In a howitzer. So your your unit was um, uh, attached to Patton's he, Third he, Army. Yeah. All right. So, Sorry. So your unit was attached at one point to a special unit of to the Battle of the Bulge campaign, the Ardennes campaign. Your unit got attached to Patton's Third Army and later to uh, also the 9th, 9th Armored Division. Yeah, that's correct. That was yeah. what I was in uh, during the Bulge. That's when you were in the Bulge. And then you later, because you, your unit was kind of an independent art field artillery unit, so oh, which yeah. means that... Yeah. Art artillery was independent and it uh, went where they needed it. Yeah, so they shifted you around every, everywhere they needed you. Uh, like fire, fire rounds, fire 105 rounds, get some donuts, fire 155 one, rounds. Right. So all the way around. Uh, then ultimately, you guys end up uh, at the end of the Battle of the Bulge uh, campaign, like like say February, uh, you, you guys were then attached to the 99th Infantry Division, the Battle Babies, you know, oh, the Checkerboard Division. And But yeah. I believe... Uh, that that you were amongst the guys that were amongst the first units that crossed the Rhine River into that's Germany. Correct. Is that correct? Right, that's correct. We were we were crossing the Rhine River uh, a whole day ahead of everybody else. Okay, and where where did you cross? Remember where you crossed the the Rhine? Remagen at the Remagen. At Remagen. Remagen. The, Luden, the famous Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen. Oh, yeah, that was some place. What did you take? Did you take pictures? <laughs> uh, so so it's, it's quite a story you uh, moved to, into the Rhineland campaign etc um, yeah, <laughs> you, you, you guys liberated a, a concentration camp or what, what do you remember about because it? it was a side camp of, of yeah. Dachau one of these uh, smaller sister camps well I was, I was amazed at the, uh, the way the, the country the lay of the country in that area uh, they had a huge there was a huge uh, tunnel in the mountain across the river, and uh, you could see action going on inside that uh, uh, inside that structure until we put a few rounds of artillery in there, and then you didn't see any more action. So yeah, yeah. Well, that's a concentration camp. Yeah. Yeah. So so when we go back to the Battle of the Bulge, which started about seven, exactly seventy six years ago uh, to this to this day. Uh, yeah. uh, um, what, what, what did you remember one day? What were you actually? What was your unit? What was your unit at? Where were you at when you heard you had to go to Belgium? And um, Foy, we were in Foy, Belgium. You moved through Foy, uh, but, but, but before that, you came. Where you come from? From France. France, yes. Yes. Okay. And then as, as part of the army. So. I assume because you were a sergeant, you were in the uh, battalion headquarters. So I assume you never were really cold, just you, you were always sleeping inside. <laughs> no, no, I never slept. Oh, you weren't? Inside nope. anywhere. <laughs> yeah. No, we were, we were sleeping under the ground and when we could get under it. And we didn't want to be dead, we wanted to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> so, so spending your time, the cold evenings uh, in the bulge, in a foxhole. So, so, or a trench. So, how did you have to dig it yourself, and how long did it take you to dig a hole uh, like well, that? Well, it depends on your incentive. If, <laughs> if the treetops were missing, you better hurry. You know, <laughs> and you could get remote control on that shovel. <laughs> <laughs> remote control on the shovel. So, so it was quite an experience. Now, if there is one event, you know, with the Battle of the Bulge that you vividly remember and that you want to share with us, like one story. I mean, not. Rhineland, not Berlin, but Battle of the Bulge. Is there one story that you want to share with us? One story that you'd like to share from the Bulge. Well, in the, when we were in the Bulge, you were battling just to stay alive. 
So every fight was was uh, if you did, if you didn't win that fight, you didn't win anymore. You know. So uh, that that's what I remember about the Bulls is you were fighting twenty four seven. Yeah, and so you were you were fighting the big guns because from what I've heard that at one point you got arrested by the police in <laughs> that. In at, that stone, Foy, at Foy, at well, Foy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we were we were on a tour, and uh, we heard the, the the police whistles, and we looked around. And we were being chased by a Belgian police car, but it had American signals all over it. So I thought, what? Well, this is a good place to be. In. And he said, "Stick out your hands." And I took out my hands and put cuffs on me. <laughs> and I, I and he said, uh, "The people of Belgium have." Uh, authorized me to arrest you for destroying our city in World War II. And, uh, the, 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 the penalty is going to be life in prison. <laughs> you know, and they just kept going on. I thought, whoa, back off here. I'm an American citizen. I got rights. You know, and, uh, but uh, they, they finally let me know that this wasn't for real. Yeah, it, it was. It was well, they told me that the jails were full. The prison was full. They had, didn't have room for you. So uh, yeah. that, that was your lucky day. So yeah, that, that was real fun. I enjoyed that. Yeah, uh, I, I was frightened. I knew I knew they were going to take good care of me. Yeah. Now, um, of course, you 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 have so many experiences from World War II, the Battle of the Bulge, and so on. So, and I remember you telling uh, people telling you like like. Like Dad, you should write this down, and and but so finally you did. You 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 found someone sitting right next to you, Mr. Robert Wise. Yes. Uh -huh. Thanks thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, how how did you guys get together now, Frank? What made you decide to write down your well to, to have Rob write down your story and well, and, and how I'm, did it how did it go? I've known Frank for 50 years, and okay. um, I was over here at his house one day. And I looked up on the wall, and here was a plaque about the Battle of the Bulge. And I said, Frank, what's this? And Frank said, oh, I never talk about it. And I said, hey, it's time to talk about it. And we started exploring what had happened. And uh, that's how the book evolved into I Marked with Patton. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah that's true. Okay. So, uh, and, and then how long did it take you? Because maybe you've heard, you had heard of many of these stories before you started writing the book. We, we worked on the book for, what would you say, Frank, a year and a half? About a year, year and a half. Uh, on getting, and off. Yeah, getting the stories, uh, <clears throat> put it, pulling them together. And uh, I would ask questions, and Frank would suddenly remember something he hadn't thought about for a while. And uh, some of the stories that popped up were, were absolutely remarkable. That's what's in the book. And, and what is one of the, the amazing stories? Because I'm now curious about the, about the book, but also the stories. What what is one of the, the highlights uh, from the book? Tell, tell, tell them about the. Uh, we've got a story for you here. Tell them about the the, the family that Piper's grandchildren shot. Oh, there was uh, in in Belgium when we got there. Uh, I commandeered a little house for my men to sleep in during the day, and. Uh, uh, a grandmother and a grandfather lived in that house. And uh, she said, the boys come in and sit. And she set us down, there's uh, seven of us, seven of the soldiers. And she said, I want to tell you a story. Uh, I, have a, I had a son that lived across the street here from us and his wife, and they had two little babies, an eight, a, a four-year-old and a five-year-old. And when the Nazis moved into our town, my little four-year-old boy looked up at this one Nazi officer and he said, you're a dirty Nazi. And the Nazi officer took the pistol out of his holder and shot the little boy. And the little little girl ran out to see what was wrong with her little brother. And the, the officer shot the little, boy, little girl. And the mother and the father ran out to protect their kids and the officer shot both of them dead. So a whole family of generations was wiped out by the cruelty of that one officer. And that, uh, that was so terrible. Uh, all, uh, seven tough men wept at the thought of that. Yeah, uh, Frank, you know, there's, there's some really terrible, terrible uh, 
terrible stories from all over the Battle of the Bulge, from all, all over World War II. Yeah. Um, but but they're not all very, very sad stories. They're also... Oh, some, no, no, there were some so, joy. Involved. Yeah, there are also some really nice, uh, nice stories. And, um, and more specific, the one that, and I can tell you this now, because that's... I remember the first time we met after that day, at the end of the day, we were standing at the pillbox at the bunker. You, when you asked me, like, Reg, may I tell a story to the group? And mm -hmm. I said, you know, the stage is all yours, Frank. And he said, and Frank, you said, it's not a story about the bulge, but it's something that happened to me years ago. Uh, and it was a story uh, about Berlin oh, on yeah. Christmas. And because as I remember well, after the Rhineland campaign, you were promoted as a line sergeant and you were sent to Berlin as a military police. I have a copy right here, Reg. Yeah, yeah, but we can't read the copy, but uh, I, would, I would love to hear the story again coming from you. Okay. Well, I wrote the story and uh, like you said, when I read this Christmas story, especially in Christmas, I cracked up and I, 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 I don't succeed in giving it my best effort. Okay. So I've asked my brother, Robert Wise, to read it for me, if you don't mind, sir. No, I don't mind. In my heart, I, I can't. I just okay. cracked up. It goes like this. I was an investigator for the military people of military police of the U.S. Army. The day was cold, gloomy, poorly dressed, hungry people seemed to move aimlessly about in the snow-covered streets. Children were standing in the snow outside the GI kitchen. There was a smell of roasted turkey and mince pie and all the wonderful aromas too tantalizing to such people with such great loss. I found myself seated at a huge table laden with, with a great dinner, the greatest I've ever seen. And, and yet outside the door were hungry stomachs swollen from lack of food. The dinner on my plate, although fit for a king, became tasteless because of those children standing in the snow that would give anything to have enjoyed that feast. I pushed aside my plate and left the table. I went to the post exchange and asked the cook to fix as many hamburgers as he could get into two paper sacks and to call me when they were ready. I went out and front of the military police headquarters and, and brushed the snow off the curb and sat down with this huge sack of burgers in my lap. Children came from all directions. I, I'd give a kid a burger with instructions to sit on the curb and eat it. No, you could not take it home. You gotta eat it right here. I had kids sitting in the snow all around me laughing and eating. I had soldiers, captain majors, and a company commander walk by and salute me. This, this is like a kind of a Paul Harvey story, says this is the rest of the story. That day, my story appeared in the paper. A man looked at me in the phone book up, looked up me in the phone book and said, You're the Frank Sisson that wrote that piece about Christmas in Germany? I told him I was. I just wanted to call you and tell you how much I appreciate your taking the time to write that article. I'm from Germany. I, I'm here to visit friends. And we were getting ready to eat our breakfast. And I asked if I might read an article that I found in the morning paper. I did. And we ought to cry, because I must tell you, I've heard your story since I was a boy, for you see, I was one of those little boys. And that that sitting in the snow by you that day was, was my father. Thank you very, very much. That's the story. Uh, so I'm speechless. I'm 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 you know, I do often tell that story on, on, on the tours when I meet people, I give it as an extra, especially when it's around the holidays. And I encourage him to eat a hamburger. Uh, and I, and I've told it a thousand times, and I've heard it many, many times, and it still gives me goosebumps. Me too. Me too. <laughs> and, and, I, and I absolutely hope that one first or second line manager of the Burger King in the U.S. 
sees this and, <laughs> and, and, and actually offers you a lifetime free meal at Burger King for you, <laughs> for you and your family. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, if I ask uh, something, uh, Frank, uh, it's 76 years ago that the Battle of the Build started. How important is it for you also that we pass on the stories to the next generations? Because uh, yeah, it, it's a new way of commemorations. And how important is it also for you? Frank, 76 years ago was the Battle of the Bulge. And how important is it to pass on these stories to the newest oh, generation? Oh, it's very important because a, a, a passion on is an experience, a personal experience. It's not something you just pick up and read in the back of the magazine. You live it, it becomes part of you. And uh, I think it's important that, that uh, the, new, the, the new generation read this type of stories and know that there was a lot of good in the war as well as a lot of bad. And uh, this happens to be the tops of good out of, that, out of that conflict. It was compassion, compassion for those children who, yeah. had, who had lost so much. Yeah. yeah. I was not a... Uh, from a rich family as a little boy and I had five brothers and five sisters so uh, a biscuit had to go a long ways yeah. <laughs> I got a lot of fork prints in the back of my hand for trying to, <laughs> trying to get the last biscuit <laughs> so Frank uh, the book I marched with Patton by uh, Robert Wise uh, documenting your story. Uh, can you can you have your copy? Yeah, can you can hold you. it up? Can you show it? Can you show it to, to the camera? Because I marched with Patton. Uh, it is available on Amazon.com. Yeah, uh, yeah. Any other way people can order a copy or get a signed copy of the book? Uh, yeah. Barnes and Nobles carries it. Okay, uh, Barnes and Noble. Amazon, uh, of course, they can order through Amazon. Okay, through Amazon.com. So you say, uh, Joel, I, yeah. I think we got someone else uh, yeah, in yeah. the waiting room, but I have a, a little question for, uh, for Frank, like, like yeah. a final question a little bit, because the book's called I Marched with Patton. So that kind of indicates that you were very fond of the general. So what, yeah, what, 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 was your, what did you think of General Patton yourself? I think he's the world's best general. I know he, he's not, he's a human just like you and I, and he makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. But he's able to overshadow those mistakes with it, with victories on the field. Yeah. And uh, I, I thought he was the greatest general we've ever had. Yeah. And did you ever met him in person during the war? Yes. Well, not personally, but uh, I brushed, I brushed tracks track with him several times. Okay. And, I, I like that. And uh, would you uh, would you have liked to 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 talk to him? Like like if you had one chance to talk to him, what would you say? Oh, like what would I say? Yeah, that up, boy, man, go get him. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, don't go yet, uh, Joel. Here you take over. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think there's somebody connecting with uh, this uh, this this live stream. Um, it's in, in a couple of minutes, and uh, maybe. Uh, uh, you can ask Frank some questions about uh, about Patton, because the granddaughter of uh, George Patton is now connecting with this live stream, Helen Patton. So uh, we have now a connection. Yeah. So uh, yeah. we're gonna have another guest here on the stream. Uh, and uh, she's trying to get into the uh, the conversation room here. Uh, you can ask Frank some questions. Hello. About, uh, Hello. Can some. you hear me? Oh, yeah, we can hear you, but we can't see you yet. Oh, there you are. Hey, it's always a little bit odd here with the um, the tilting of the screen, uh, sort of sideways. Let's see here. Okay, it's great to see you, Helen. Hey, it's great to see you, too. Is that better? Can you, you look that, great. You look fantastic. No, but I, I, but no, I'm looking at you. That's the main thing. Yeah, well, you just look at the camera. Yeah, no, but okay, but am I looking at you? No, am I looking at your, your? A little bit here. Okay. 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 Helen, okay. okay. put the, okay. the 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 sound. Hey, it's good to see you too. better? All right. You have to turn your sound off. Your sound off. No, but I. Sorry, we have too many videos. <laughs> okay, much better. Hello, Helen. Welcome. 
Good evening. Hey, welcome, welcome. Good evening. Hello, we just, so... we, just, we just spoke to Mr. Francis, and he's still here with us uh, in your yeah. screen. And yeah. uh, I don't know if you heard what he just said about your grandfather. I did, and I want to read that book. <laughs> I marched with Patton, and I feel really ashamed that I haven't got that in my shelf. Boy, I'm, I, I wish I could just reach through this virtual reality and give you a big hug, sir, Sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> Can you turn it down, Hans? Because I think it's yeah. too loud over there. Um, yeah. So, Frank, you got any any words for Helen? You know, maybe. Uh, uh, well, uh, only one occasion where I, I uh, came close to shaking the hand of Patton. Uh, I was uh, laying some telephone wire to the to the artillery, and I saw this truck coming down the hill. And it had uh, flags on the fenders, which indicates uh, royalty. <laughs> uh, and uh, when it got down to where I could see what was going on, it was Patton, Bradley, and uh, Eisenhower uh, coming down the hill in this station wagon. And uh, as they passed, they all three saluted me because I was out in the middle of the road and I heard. As well the they traffic. should. As well the they should have. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, uh, but the treetops started shaking and rocking, and that means our is coming in, and everybody ran for cover. Yeah. Um, but the general had already passed and was out out of range and out of danger. But, tell, tell them what happened when you went for cover. Oh, I dived under an old bombed out tank, and I kept moving forward so I could get as much protection as possible. And I bumped into something. And I looked up and it was a kid I played football with when I was in high school, back home. Wow. So I thought they had a small world, a small world. But, well, uh, we probably don't have much more time to, to visit. No, you have, as far as I'm concerned, you have all the time in the world. Yeah, yeah, and I think the people who are watching are really pleased to, to, to see us together. And uh, thank you for your, your co-writer there, Mr. Weiss, yeah? Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Yeah. And, and we'll we'll make sure Helen gets your email address. Yeah, uh, yeah. I want to ask. I, I want to ask you first of all. I'd like to mention you. You mentioned the trees, and I'd like to say that Reg Jens uh, described once to me about how dangerous it is to be around trees during all these bombardments. Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, you yes. taught me the real meaning of tree hug hugging. Oh right? yeah, I remember. The other one, we were in the, in the Bois Jack. Mm -hmm. But actually those stories, those, those palpable memories, and also we had quite a palpable memory that was given to us by Peewee, <laughs> living up to his, <laughs> sorry, I'm making a big of a joke of his, his story, but it was really, it was really real. I mean, these body uh, experiences, these, these, these uh, difficulties to just survive bodily in, in, during your, your uh, wartime and, and during these battles is something that we tend to just breeze right over when, when, we, when we see the, the romantic images of the, the wars and, you know, so I appreciate that. They're talking about uh, I carried a copy of the 91st Psalms in my pocket. Uh -huh. And when I got into a, dis a, a position of real, real, real danger, I'd whip that article out and I'd read it and read it and read it. And God pulled me through every, every one of those battles. God took care of me. And Helen uh, Lincoln sends you a signed copy of the book. Um, get your address, we'll send you a signed copy. Done. Uh, I'd like to ask you if you recognize this, sir. Patton's weather prayer. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. What is it? Not a first song. <laughs> no, but I'll tell you, he knows his. He knows his Bible. Let's yes. get the ninety-first Psalm out. Maybe we can read it. Also, well, but I have my my grandfather's uh, book here yeah, as okay. my kind of cliff notes, but I, you know, with with Reg around, I, I may not need it. But uh, and Joel, right. thank it, you. But um, I was I was looking at his his uh, description of the what of of this famous prayer that my grandfather, you know, he was so he was so 
worried. He knew y'all. He knew that it, the 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 men and the artillery and everything was was just as he had arranged it in his inimitable way. Um, you know, he 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 sped up. He sped he sped to Bastogne, and he 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 kind of took matters into his own hands. I'm not so sure that he asked permission for, for going as soon as he did. Isn't that right, Reg? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but he, he did have one thing, you all had one thing against you constantly and that was the weather. So I don't know if you remember the story, but he commissioned, I didn't pay the, uh, the priest. In fact, the priest said, you can't ask God favors, but he said, write me a weather prayer. We have to pray for good weather because yeah, right. everything else is is going our way but the weather and so chaplain o'neill who my grandfather spoke to in the little chapel at uh, pescatore in luxembourg where he was holed up right. um, put together this weather prayer and it was printed gosh of almost three hundred and fifty thousand of them yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah. I don't know if you still have one, but shall I read it? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. To each officer and soldier of the 3rd United States Army, I wish a Merry Christmas. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We march in our might to complete victory. May God's blessing rest upon each of you this Christmas Day. George S. Patton, Jr. Oh, that's great. That's true. And uh, this is the prayer. Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate rains with which we have had to contend, and winds and snow and ice and cold. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers who call upon thee, that armed with thy power, we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Wow. And you know, when, it, when the weather broke through, uh, now let's see, that would have been exactly on the 26th, would you say? Yeah. Or 27th? Where would you say, Reg? Well, when did the weather really clear up? When it really cleared up, it was was a little bit later because it was uh, now the first day of a really like drizzly, like a small small coat of snow melting during the daytime, but a real mm -hmm. heavy snow. And when, well, well, this is the best stone area, okay? When you talk mm -hmm. about twenty miles north, there was mm -hmm. more snow. Mm -hmm. Fifty miles north was already a lot of snow. Uh, for best stone, the heavy snow started to come in starting on the twenty fourth of December, like through the morning mm -hmm. into the afternoon, and it snowed all the way through Christmas. So I think then there was like kind of a, a little break around the 26th because okay. it's not constant snowing. So, but yeah. sky cleared once on the 23rd of December. So that's when Operation Nuts was carried out when the Pathfinders parachuted into Best Stone. And then weather, it was like, it was up ups and downs because it's cleared yeah. a bit in January. It's like you can have like snow, blue sky, but then the fog would come in at 4 p.m. It gets black dark at 4.30 in winter time here in Belgium. But there were the so, breaks um, in the clouds just enough to get those, the, the, uh, oh, yeah. the air power Yeah, across. exactly, exactly. And, and I met somebody in Bastogne, actually, who feels he remembers that actual moment. And he actually, mm. as I looked up and I saw the skies part for a moment and the sun break through and yeah. the airplanes go. Oh yeah, absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. It was dramatic. My grandfather said uh, that he had to thank his commander in chief. Okay. And he was very frustrated because the prayer was commissioned on the 17th. It was ready on the 23rd, but I guess it wasn't, he wasn't getting a yes mm. uh, for uh, until a few days later. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, because that the weather that was like one part George Patton did not control. Oh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly, because that's the only thing he, he could not control because he had everything perfectly planned. At, at one point, uh, I remember that uh, reading by your brother's book, Helen, uh, with the letters of, of your grandfather, because your dad was at West Point during that time, you know, uh, that he writes a letter back to your father saying, dear son, everything's going quite well here in the European theater. And so far, I managed to get to all the places the enemy expected me to be. 
Only I got there three days before they did. And that's right. <laughs> and 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 I see. I've got something here. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, let's see. On the twenty first, um, he just says he says all of my colleagues. Oh, on the twenty first, I let me try to do a little imitation mm -hmm. of my grandfather. You know, he has a kind of you know he had a bit of a high voice. You know, on the twenty first, I received quite a few telephone calls from the various higher echelons expressing solicitude as to my ability to attack successfully with only three divisions. So yeah. they were, they were, yeah. they were, he was happy to get to, to, to get a pat on the back. Action, <laughs> action. Uh, okay. Yeah, because as you have to understand at that time, George Patton, they, they, something he really hated is that they used him as a diversion for Normandy. Because the Germans were yeah. like actually watching him, and he always wanted to be out there in the front, like leading the attack. Yeah, and now they kept him in England, so he, he couldn't very hard for him to digest because they sent him in like four weeks later. So this was like finally like okay, let's get to action right now. That's what he really wanted. Well, he had a, a famous saying, and it's part of his patent principles. Now, a good plan today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow. So he goes on to 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 say that. Um, I maintained my contention that it is better to attack with a small force at once than it, and attain surprise than it is to wait and to lose it. And I have to say that I really loved your um, comment uh, about if we lose this battle, we won't win another one. Yes, I have to, I'm, I'm, I wrote it down actually, as you said, spoke it, sir. Um, it was yes. Just can you repeat it? If we lose, if if we lose this one, we won't have a chance to win another one. Is that what you said earlier? Yeah, yeah. must win this one to win the next one. You, you, very profound. That's a yeah. profound, a profound, profound statement. Yeah. 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 In, in closing statement for me, uh, I admired your grandfather immensely. He was a general of generals. And he never made a move until he talked to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I will leave you, if you don't mind, with a quote and a blessing from my grandfather. I won't, I won't necessarily leave the discussion, but yeah, I can if you like. But um, <laughs> you have been baptized in fire and blood and have come out steel. Right. Yeah. I love, yeah, yeah, I love that quote. <laughs> Takes a lot of heat to make an armor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we, we're, go, we're definitely going to make sure uh, Frank and yeah. Tina and Sven to fire that email address, Helen's yeah. way and the other way around, so you guys can be in touch, send the book, yeah. etc. cetera. Uh, Frank, it was great seeing you. I yeah. hope many people go look for that book. If you could show it one more time. Yeah, one more time. Uh, or, 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 yeah, one more time. <laughs> Please, people, go read the book. Um, very worth it. A lot of stories. Uh, Helen, yeah. you exchange emails. Yeah. 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 So to, to get the book. And, and I uh, hope, and I hope, one, just to, to, to stop my talking for a little bit, I just have one more thing to say. I just hope that this year at Christmas, a lot, a lot of people will have a hang, hamburger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With Frank, because that's yeah. what he still does at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will. I will make a picture and I will put it on my Facebook. Okay, this is a, uh, this is a uh, call uh, calling out to everybody watching. Christmas Day, eat a hamburger, make a photo, and send it to Joel. We'll post it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, go, we go to post it on Facebook. Frank, Merry Christmas and then uh, Happy. And Helen, Helen, stay with us, please. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, okay. Frank. Merry Christmas, Frank. Christmas to you, you both. Later. It's a privilege to have met you, even virtually. Yes. Yeah. Um, Our pleasure. God bless you. God bless okay. you. Bye bye. The best. Talk to you later, Frank. Thank you. All right. What a beautiful moment. What a great opportunity for yes. me, also. Yes. Thank yes. you. And uh, I, I think they're going to send the copy sign. <laughs> wow. I could try to make it easy for them. <laughs> Maybe I can get them to send it somewhere in the United States. Uh, uh, Helen, amazing that you have time for this this live stream and that you are uh, available to, to do it and to remember to get to with all the people from all over the world on Facebook, on YouTube, 
uh, 76 years, the Battle of the Bulge, uh, most of the events from COVID were, were cancelled. Uh, how was it for you to, to be able to, I, I, I was thinking... You I, was, I, I did manage to go yeah. to Bastogne. Yeah. And I have to say that um, it was profound. It was as profound, but in a totally different way. I, I feel a, a cry, I hope I don't cry while I'm talking about it, that has begun from the moment that I started this work, quite unexpectedly started this work. I never, I'm not a historian. I, I was peripherally interested in my grandfather's story growing up, usually resisting it because, you know, you want to be your own person and this heavy, heavy weight of having this legacy was easier for being a female in the family than for the males in the family. But that's a whole other story. But um, from the moment that I did get involved and when I did meet the very first veterans uh, along the Liberty Road, I began a deep cry of my own, knowing that this was even 25 years ago when I began going to be a short-lived period. And this pandemic, this virus has imposed a break for us. In one way, it's made it a little easier because it's come all at once and it's, it, it's been painfully, gradually difficult to lose the veterans, yeah. yeah. But it is our lot and it is something we have to now just, we have to accept it and it's been really, really hard because the onus is now, especially on those of us who've had the privilege even just now with a very vital and fully alive veteran. I don't want to, you know, say that, that they're not with us still, but, but come on, we all can smell the coffee on this one. And um, so that day in Bastogne, that was so, it was sunny in the morning, but it was bleak in the afternoon um, and so quiet and nothing going on. In fact, I had to grab my flowers from the gas station. <laughs> you know, they're not even florists. I don't even think we're open. Um, it felt also important. It felt like, okay, take a breath. And now, how are we going to earn this? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's uh, that, 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 that's why I think it's important also tonight to, to reflect on, on the events on 76 with the veterans, because I think that's all about, because uh, they can share the stories also them with video, but I think it's it's important to pass on the stories also from your grandfather, but also from all the veterans and oh, especially yeah. especially from the veterans. Yeah, yeah. My grandfather's stories are are here, and they'll just there's there's not much more to say, uh, but 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 it will be exciting to hear stories be said differently, yeah. and yeah, I even was challenged this year to. Uh, construct a scenario for an opera. Oh, okay. About my grandfather. <laughs> and it happened, or uh... well, I think it's on the way. But I will say that in many ways, that is a perfect forum for being able to say what has been left unsaid, um, because you know, art, certain, especially painting and dancing and opera, they're they're so. You, you, can, you can throw all of the emotion and the abstract yeah. that actually can maybe even get to the, the core of, of the truth even better than telling history exactly as it was yeah, yeah, yeah. in a strange kind of a way. Yeah. Hey, because the whole thing is about elevating humanity. Yeah. We have to elevate humanity now. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. You're right. And then Helen, uh, you're, you're a chairwoman of the Petal Foundation. What kind of work is this foundation uh, doing? That kind of work. I mean, yeah. I'm going with the flow. Um, yeah. I created rather receptacles um, and, and they're permutations of, of my foundations and of which there are many. And the only reason for that is because each country has its own set of rules. I would be very happy if there was just one. So I created for myself a kind of a one-stop shopping, which is the Patent Alliance. And that's where everything comes together. But right now we have a faction, a new faction in France. Uh, there's always been a faction in Luxembourg and that predominantly has been to um, be present to my grandfather's legacy there, as well as to connect with the 
um, the modernity and and also the European Union was, was, was began there, the progress of Europe. And so I was also, we were involved with, yes, uh, attending the ceremonies at the place where my grandfather is buried in Luxembourg, but also being involved with a group like the Young Scientists of Luxembourg, because uh, my grandfather was very much always on the cutting edge and very interested in, you know, what the next um, invention would would be to help you know be be victorious, uh, for example. That's a, and and in Germany, uh, my work uh, it's taken a bit of a lull in Germany itself, although it's kind of come over to France, and I'll explain that. It began with um, my own personal search for understanding the German culture. And also, what what were the seeds of war uh, within? Um, what, what what were causing the seeds of war? I mean, I I rem what caused what caused the wars, and what what about that would have been inherent even in um, my own personal experience of being an American trying to live in Germany. How do, I don't want to say this without uh, and and offend anybody. Um, I'm fascinated with with cultural differences. And by, at, at the time I was a, a, a married uh, doctor's wife in Germany um, with this legacy and, and I was feeling uh, the tremors of, of, of um, both knowing that, 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 that this was the enemy, but also knowing that my own family had a legacy of love and friendship with the Germans from the time that I was born. And my father, I don't know if you know this, but my father was best friends with uh, Manfred Rommel, who was uh, the Desert Fox's son. They actually even shared a birthday. Okay. We, would, we would come together on Christmas and celebrate. Um, so there was this um, dichotomy within me also that I became fascinated with. So I did a lot of projects to bring people together. Uh, from from various cultures, uh, including a, a very exciting time when I focused on Bosnia and brought Bosnians, uh, Croats, and Serbians to the Schengen area, so that they could experience uh, the possibilities. And then finally, uh, when the anniversaries began to rev up, and boy did they rev up! I was just taken into this tidal wave of like, oh my gosh, I can't. I have to keep coming and welcoming the veterans to France. And then there was a house that was bestowed upon me to take care of in, in Normandy, which was by the apple orchard where my grandfather had been hiding in the summer of 1944. And then I said, well, I have to replant these apple trees. And then suddenly we had Calvados and then suddenly it just grew and grew and grew. Uh, this, this kind of um, uh, infiltration, re-infiltration on what for me would become the beginning of the Liberty Road. It is the Liberty Road, you know, from, from Normandy to the Czech Republic actually, but, but uh, technically it's the 1146 markers that we pass from Utah Beach all the way to Bastogne. And that became then a concentration for me. Um, and so I just have been trying to be open to, to provide contexts. Um, we, uh, we, my colleagues and I, and we've had many uh, people stepping in and out of, of the work and, and sometimes people walk with you for a time and then step off and then there's something that's, that's their thing. Like we, we put together a big concert um, on this for the 70th anniversary. I, we were deter I was determined to uh, see uh, people from all of the nationalities uh, that had been represented during the war to include the Germans sing together in a rock and roll concert. On, on Utah Beach, and that was really cool. And then um, I guess the most recent great project was to reactivate the um, Champagne Bowl, which relates to our theme because in uh, the November uh, or, or October, November of, of 44, when the 101st were having their downtime in Reims or Reims as we pronounce it in France, um, they decided that they, they, the projection was this war is coming to an end. We'll all be going home. We're not going to probably make it home for Christmas, but let's celebrate anyway. And let's put together a football game. And 
So they teamed up and auditioned and practiced very hard, uh, the Sky Train and the Screaming Eagles to compete with one another. And of course, even, even though inv invitations were printed and plans were made and it was called the Champagne Bowl because it was in Reims, but thanks to the Battle of the Bulge, instead of playing football, these guys were going to put themselves in really harm's way. And so we decided 75 years later, 74 years later, actually, and we've done it twice, to, to reinstigate the Remembrance Bowl. And the 101st came to Normandy to actually play it. Oh, which is which is outstanding. I still yeah. remember that. That was that was so nice. Very well put together. Uh, you, you mentioned the hundred and first. Remember who won the game? <laughs> well, who won the? Oh yeah, um, the, uh, no, the hundred and first won the game because yes. it was only the hundred and first that was playing. <laughs> <laughs> well, the because next you mentioned eighty second are going to play. Yeah. So because you mentioned the hundred and first, Helen, uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a little break with some small video, and then we're gonna get back to. Uh, to the 101st Airborne yeah. Museum, Le Mess in Bastogne, right. because uh, they're ready, you know, to to join in uh, after Ronnie this. Bona. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Joel. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, Helen, I, I want to thank you for for this uh, amazing interview. Also, I think it was a great experience connecting you also with a World War II veteran that writes a book about. Uh, uh, Me also. Veteran. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, the website of, of the Patton Foundation is on our website, so you can, yeah. can find it. Uh, maybe you can name it uh, again. It for would be, a the, yes, the, the, the patentfoundation.org or the Patent Alliance. Yeah, yeah. www.patentalliance.org. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Thank, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you uh, for, for your time. And now we're going to look at uh, a small video, a press video about the Bastogne Barracks, because the barracks in Bastogne are home to all sorts of military vehicles, part of the Royal Museum of the Armed Forces. It's an amazing place to visit, and we will be right back with you with a live stream from the 101st Airborne Museum, La Messe from Bastogne. See you right back.
Uh, the, uh, yeah, nice video. Well worth a visit, I think, uh, when uh, Rek went after the COVID to visit the, the Bastoian barracks. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we have the privilege of being in direct contact with the 101st Airborne Museum in, uh, in, in Baston with uh, Johnny Bona. Uh, the 101st Airborne Museum Le Mess in Baston is located in the former official officer's mess building of the Belgian Army and has a big collection of original items of the Battle of the Bulge with authentic reconstructions and really re realistic uh, mannequins. That makes the museum, I think, uh, well worth a visit. Uh, I've, be, uh, I've been there a couple of times and it's really impressive. Uh, Johnny Bona, welcome to this uh, live presentation. You can tell something more about uh, the museum. Eh? Hi, everybody. Greetings from the 101st Airborne Museum in Bastogne, the most American city in Europe. Bastogne, a small town in the middle of the Ardennes, became famous due to the American resistance during the last German and greatest German offensive in the West, December 44, 1945, January 45. We can talk during hours about tactics, about combat, fights, tanks, generals, but I will resume it in single words. And I prefer this than stuff, weapons, uniform, cohesion, and buyer in arms. The most decisive gains in that period had been the work of the fighting men themselves and in their feeling about one another. As a former officer from the Belgium army, I know what it means. In the beginning of the Battle of Bastogne, the different elements of the defense were almost out of communication with one with the other. Things had happened so fast that they had been compelled to engage the enemy before giving a thought to their own liaison. But in the course of the battle, the infantry, the armored forces, the artillery and the tank destroyer crews had taken full measure of each other and found the mirror sufficient. The burst of the mutual confidence and respect had produced not only tactical cohesion, but comradeship in such a degree that before the siege was over, these units were to ask the higher commander whether it wouldn't be possible for them to be joined permanently in a large force. They had come to believe that together they had become irresistible. And that's, that's really, for me, the most important thing when soldiers in combat become band of brothers, they are brothers forever and they will never forget what they had hard fights to in the past. May we never forget the sacrifice of all these guys. And that message is even worth today for the new soldiers in each army in the world. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very nice. well said, Johnny. Yeah, really, a little bit and goosebumps. Goosebumps, yeah. And Johnny, you're also involved in the, in the museum. You have realistic dioramas. Can you tell something about that? Uh, um, well, we wanted, to, by building up that museum, to bring back the people in the past and make the, the displays, the dioramas, so realistic as possible to touch the feeling of the people. A helmet, a weapon, a, a uniform, you can find it in every museum. But for me, the most important is to touch the feeling of the people so that we may never forget what soldiers and uh, civilians had to endure during such difficult periods. That's why in the 101st Airborne Museum, you can experience a bombing shelter, a very amazing bombing shelter. During six minutes, you will be like a refugee in a cellar during a bombing in December 44. And when- well, I Okay. I remember that, Johnny, because I remember the first time I was in that bomb shelter there, I was like shivering like a leaf when I came out of that one. 
<laughs> Seriously, it's very, very realistic, very, very well done. Yeah, I was there a couple of times. It's, it's, it's amazing, yeah. No matter for us if somebody makes a difference between an American helmet or a German helmet, mm -hmm. no, the feeling, yeah. the feeling, the emotion, the experience, bring back in the past so we may never forget and preserve history is, that's the way to preserve history, yeah. actually. Yeah. Well, and not just to preserve, Johnny, it's, it's a way to preserve it and to pass it on to the future generations. And to pass it on, that's which, right. Which is very, very important too. So that's also one aspect that you guys uh, are carrying out or are doing so. I know the first time that I visited the museum, uh, also the music, the background music, the realistic mannequins, I was really sucked into the history uh, when you look in, in some of the eyes, uh, eyes of some of the mannequins, it's really impressive. Then you can see the war, the, the cold, the, the feeling of, of uh, terrible conditions during the Battle of the Bulge. So uh, it's a compliment for you, Johnny, and your team, Hans von Kessel uh, and everybody involved in the museum. I think everybody needs to go to, to the museum after COVID crisis. Uh, uh, then we can travel a lot again, I think. Uh, you can find the, the, the website on, on the webpage in this uh, live stream. And hopefully a lot of people going to visit the museum because it's well worth to visit. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you totally. We are ready to meet you at the One First Table Museum to give you briefings and to spend good time together in the way to keep them alive. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Frank, to, to, to sharing this, this stories and, and also the information about the museum. I wish Sorry. you a Merry Christmas and, uh, and a good and healthy 2021. And where we hopefully can visit the museum again in uh, 2021. I think there's also a conclusion of this amazing live stream, Rack. Oh, is there? Oh, oh well, well, well you, you got me there, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Joe. Already um, there. Yeah. Well, well, yes. Well, I want to thank everybody who participated uh, and everybody who watched this live stream. Um, a, a, a big, big thank you to Jimmy Martin, yeah. who actually, you know, 99 years old. You know, we've got Frank Sis in 95, still up and shining, yeah. you know, and what I hope that even we are unable to go to the Bulge area to commemorate uh and to attend several events like we normally do joe uh yep. here hopefully this little stream contributed to the goal of keeping the memory uh, memory alive and to honor the veterans because it's so important to the future generations yep. that they will learn even long after these men are no more so that they will still remember and learn about this it's very 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 yep. important yeah, I think it's, it's, it's important to keep the memories alive. And that's also what, why, why we're doing this live stream, but also the work as a guide, because I think it's telling the stories. Uh, to it's the part of it. It's part of it. You know, it's, we it's now here this, this evening, and I think everybody on the live stream is hearing in the stories and uh, hope be going to record it and place it on YouTube and Facebook. But I think it's uh, when we can travel again, Rec, people can definitely go with you on tour. In, in absolutely, the absolutely. So uh, hopefully uh, somewhere 2021, whether it's spring, summer, or uh, or next year, December, and when we're back able yeah. to go out in groups and tour the battlefields, I'll be happy to take you around and, um, and share more of these amazing stories about these even more amazing men. Yes, uh, I'm going to conclude this live stream. Um, join uh, Rec with his tours next year in uh, the Boston area. He, his agenda is empty. Well, so the whole bulge area, actually. The whole bulge area, so we can fill it again. Uh, everybody, good evening uh, and a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, next year, we will be back with a lot of live streams with historians, but we did the last ones. And if you missed a couple of, of live streams, you can still see them back on, on YouTube. Uh, and hopefully I'm going to see you next year with one of my tours or from Rec uh, or some of our live streams. And thank you for everybody participating in our live streams. Helen, Jim Martin, uh, uh, Frank Sisson, Rec, you also, uh, uh, the Holland First Airborne Museum, uh, everybody. And uh, I'll see you next year. Stay and, safe and healthy. And don't forget to eat your burgers on Christmas. Yes, I want to see the pictures. Thank you. Me too.